communicating that the not just what we're doing but why we're doing it is increasingly important because this is a fast evolving situation and yet sort of at the same time the, the corollary to that is recognize that building trust it requires an investment and commitment over time. Hey gang, it's Thursday, March 10th. Dave and listeners, welcome to the Behind the Numbers Daily, an e-marketer podcast made possible by Mountain. I'm Marcus, and today I'm joined by our principal analyst who heads up our marketing desk. It's Dave Franklin. Hi, Marcus. Good to see you. Hey, chap. Thanks for joining me today. We'd obviously normally be doing a fact of the day, but given the sensitivity of today's topic, uh, we're going to leave it for today. We'll be back with the fact of the day starting from uh, Monday's episode. Uh, Today's real topic, how marketers are dealing with the Russia-Ukraine situation. So, Dave, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine began on February 24th. Russian President Vladimir Putin launched what he called a special military operation into the country of about 40 million people who live in the Ukraine, writes Jen Kirby and Jonathan Guya of Vox. Mr. Putin claimed the Russian military seeks demilitarization and denazification, but not occupation. Attacks shortly followed from multiple fronts and targeted toward multiple cities. The war is into its 15th day and over 2 million people have fled Ukraine. A UN agency reckons up to 4 million people, almost a tenth of Ukraine's population might flee in the coming weeks. The EU thinks up to 7 million refugees is more likely. That's a quarter of the population eligible to leave because Ukraine men aged 18 to 60 have to stay in the country as they may be conscripted. Aside from the enormous humanitarian crisis, oil prices have soared. The global benchmark Brent crude has topped $130 million a barrel after coming down a little bit, the highest level since July 2008. Russia's economy, similar to Ukraine's, has been pummeled. Pushback against the Russian assault has played out prominently in the form of economic sanctions, company exits and widespread moral outrage, writes Tiffany Sue of the New York Times. Marla Kaplowitz, the chief executive of the 4As, an advertising trade group, recently said the whole world is reacting in a different way, rallying around Ukraine. It's not enough to just say something, you actually have to do something. So Dave, before we kind of delve into how brands, companies have responded, what might be more appropriate behavior, how, you know, how should they respond in this situation? Let's zoom out for a second and talk about marketing and marketing with values in mind. You're working on some research at the moment, which is incredibly timely. What are just some of your thoughts on or some of your findings from the research in terms of marketers aligning themselves with different issues? Yeah. So first of all, thanks for having me. And I think, you know, the idea of marketing and brands sort of intersecting with social issues, with politics, um, with environmental concerns. You know, there's been a whole bunch of topics that brands have been getting more involved with over recent years. There's a term that's known as brand standing, which is sort of brands taking a stand around specific topics and, and issues, whether those be political, social, whatever else. And consumers have historically been relatively split you know, just under a half want companies to take a stand, just under a half don't want companies to take a stand. And then you have your sort of don't care, don't knows. Mm -hmm. So depending on the topic, then even taking a stand, you further split the audience because for every topic, certainly in the US, it feels like 50% are in favor of one thing and 50% are against it. Mm -hmm. So from a pure sort of whether to stand for something or not, it's not always a straightforward question. And I think it's one of the things that makes the Ukraine situation stand out is that obviously companies have taken different stances or said different things, done different things, but a much larger group seem to be doing something than your average topic that that may cause brands to get involved. Right. Yeah. It's a just it's a much more significant issue than than what we're used to, what brands are used to reacting to. There's some research from Forrester. And they did a a quick pulse check poll of just over 800 adults across the US, Canada and the UK to gauge sentiment, consumer sentiment over the Russian invasion of Ukraine. 
And uh, it, it, I mean, it wasn't even close. Basically, everybody, nearly 700 of those people, wanted businesses to pull their operations out of Russia immediately. Most of those strongly agreed with that sentiment. So it does seem like all bets are off in terms of what your know, usual playbook, uh, should I get involved, should I not? Uh, especially once you see a lot of people in your space getting involved, but this just seems like a completely different ball game. You do have a lot of folks aligning themselves, making purchase decisions based on values as well. SurveyMonkey had some research from last summer looking at the number of people who had made a purchase decision based on values in the past year, 80 percent of folks. Um, so pretty much everyone at, at this point. Dave, going back to Marla uh, Kaplowitz's comments, chief executive of the 4A's uh, advertising group saying the whole world is reacting in a different way, rallying around Ukraine. It's not enough to just say something, you actually have to do something. I mean, we'll talk a bit more about this in detail later, but is that true? Is, is standing on the sidelines and, and yelling something not enough? You've got to get in the game. Well, I think every company has to do what's, what they believe is right for them. I would sort of always recommend you start from your own corporate values. Mm -hmm. That being said, when you consider the likes of Shell and other oil companies pulling out of agreements in, in Russia, it's hard to argue that if you're selling cars or burgers or whatever else, that your interests in, in Russia are more valuable than anyone else's. I think this is one of those issues where consumers and investors increasingly are expecting brands to take that stand and to be really clear on, on what it is that they are saying and what it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Let's look at what folks, yeah, what companies are doing. You've got, uh, well, the big splash recently was Accenture. They ceased doing business in Russia entirely due to the invasion of Ukraine, becoming the first major company in the marketing and advertising industry to adopt such a firm stance, writes Insider Intelligence Briefing Director Jeremy Goldman. In Russia, the company, the worldwide consulting firm, has 2,500 employees, Global Innovation Lab as well, which launched in Moscow in 2018. And they Accenture made about $120 million in Russia uh, for the fiscal year ending August 31st, 2021. So that's Accenture. But Dave, we've seen rival professional services uh, firms, BCG, McKinsey, they will no longer deal with uh, official Russian organizations and they join Apple. Until Nike. their current projects expire. They are going ah, to complete what they're doing, which I thought was that's the fine interesting. Print. Got mm -hmm. it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they join Apple, Nike, Nike, uh, Canada Goose, Oracle, Ikea, H&M, ASOS, Netflix, TikTok, other notable folks uh, in marketing and advertising who have either stopped selling their products or reduced services in Russia. Microsoft suspended new sales in Russia. Google, Twitter, Snapchat have suspended all ads in the country. Facebook won't let Russian advertisers create or run ads anywhere in the world. So a lot of folks doing a lot of things. Dave, what's jumped out to you about all of these different moves? So I'd say the first thing I would say is it's really hard, just like we were talking about the professional services side of things, it's really hard to separate what's meaningful versus what's just an announcement. Yeah, There was a lot of pushback early on Facebook, Meta, Google for allowing uh, disinformation, for making money off of ads, et cetera. I think they've all rallied around really quickly. I think in some cases, it's some companies have done a phenomenal job. I would probably point to Airbnb as one. In two respects, mm -hmm. actually, what's really interesting. One is they made 100,000 rooms available for short-term stay. They also became a way for people to get money into the country. People were booking Airbnb locations, obviously with no intention of going staying there, but the host mm. uh, owner of that property was then receiving receiving money. I'm sure there's probably some money laundering law that says that that can't be done. I'd be very surprised if anyone goes after those people for doing mm -hmm. that. Others doing, you know, I think, mentioning professional services, there's some ad holding companies and firms that have done some really, really gone out of their way to do publicists, for example, guaranteed salaries, they advance the March salary, they're providing security and health and housing and relocation efforts. And so some companies really going above and beyond, there's a lot donating. So Accenture, which you mentioned, made a $5 million donation to Ukraine focused charities. Mm -hmm. You know, there's other things where there's headlines coming out for Disney, Sony, Warner Brothers halting movie releases. You know, it doesn't quite feel the same level of action. It is action, but mm -hmm. it's not quite the same as housing people, etc. And then there's the fine print that you mentioned. IKEA is one of those companies that has ceased operations. But there's a lot of questions at the moment about their sourcing. They apparently get a lot of their lumber from Russia 
And there's, there's questions about whether that has mm-hmm. ceased or, you know, so when we say we're stopping certain things, are we stopping all of it? Did we get the headline and we move on and nobody's really digging in that, that intently because there's just so much going on. So is there a, a threshold of going above and beyond? Like, is there a barometer of which people are going to evaluate these different companies? Because to your point, so Accenture, you know, not only just pulling out of the country and ceasing operations, but donating the $5 million to assist Ukrainian citizens and uh, who are seeking asylum in neighboring countries, but also matching all employee donations dollar for dollar. Then you've got folks like Airbnb, who you mentioned, you know, providing short-term housing to 100,000 Ukrainian uh, refugees. You've got other donations, IKEA, $22 million to displace Ukrainians, Unilever donating food and hygiene products. You've got business operations being ceased, H&M, ASOS, Burberry, Boohoo, suspending Russian sales. But then you've got companies like you know WPP, they've discontinued operations in Russia, 1,400 employees. However, they draw less than 1% of their annual revenue from that country. And in a statement, they said that they're having an ongoing presence in the country responsible for a horrific attack on Ukraine would be inconsistent with our values as a company. Are people going to look at that and say, well, you make barely any money there. It was, e- mm-hmm. it was, that's too easy a move. Or are they going to say you did something and that's okay? I think if history tells us anything, people will pay attention while there's a spotlight and then that attention goes away. So even yeah. to the extent that we will yeah. pay attention to that, it's interesting you mentioned H&M. Uniqlo has been public. They're one of the few companies that's been fairly vocal and clear saying that they're staying in Russia. They see clothing as a basic human need was their statement Mm -hmm. and will Mm -hmm. continue to, to sell their products in Russia. McDonald's is coming under a lot of pressure. Interestingly, though, I think McDonald's is coming under pressure from investors rather than consumers. And I think where you would genuinely see major movement is when we see reaction from consumers. We're seeing a lot of boycott hashtags, you know, Coca-Cola, Mondelez, Starbucks, others have seen that hashtag. But of those people that even use that hashtag, how many of them are actually boycott? And until there's an impact on the brand, they're going to continue to do what they do. I don't know that anyone's not going to buy a Uniqlo jacket and is going to buy an H&M jacket because of their stance in Russia, because A, that news gets buried, and B, if somebody wants the Uniqlo jacket, sometimes that desire trumps the the stand that we wish to take, and it's easier to take that stand with a hashtag than it is with our wallet. Yes. Uh, I want to talk a bit more about consumers, but we'll leave that to the other side of the ad break, where we'll also talk about what brands uh, shouldn't be doing and things that they should be watching out for or avoiding when it comes to, to brand safety. Time for a quick word from our sponsor, Mountain, and then we'll be right back. If running TV ads were as easy as paid search and social, everyone would be doing it. That's where Mountain Performance TV comes in. It's the world's first and only connected TV software platform that makes television advertising as intuitive as the rest of your self-serve performance channels, with access to premium streaming networks and technology optimized to drive performance. You have a new way to drive website visits and conversions. Visit mountain.com to learn more. All right, Dave, we are back talking about how marketers are dealing with the Russia-Ukraine situation. Uh, I wanted to c- keep talking about consumers for a second because Gajo Sevilla and Rachel Wolf, two insider intelligence analysts, just recently wrote a piece saying consumers around the world will feel the impact of the war in Ukraine. They went on to write, we're already seeing the Ukraine conflict's effect on gas prices. Now everything from food to materials for chip and automotive production could be disrupted. Various multinational companies, Coca-Cola and Nestle, have shuttered their factories and offices in Ukraine, halting production and shipment of goods and components. Ukraine and Russia together account for nearly one-third of the world's wheat market, one-fifth of the world corn supply, nearly all, 80%, of exported sunflower oil per insider, our sister company. Maersk is mulling the suspension of all container bookings in and out of Russia per Reuters, a move that could have serious repercussions for the global shipping industry. But Dave, focusing on consumers for a second, what do you think is going to be the most important thing when it comes to consumers and and how they will be affected? Obviously, humanitarian crisis aside, how do you see it affecting them and what's going to be most important to them? I think you touched on probably the most 
significant impacts. It's going to affect pricing. It's going to affect supply chain components, availability, and commodities. And that's going to have a knock-on effect. When you look at what's going on with the overall economy, again, in the U.S. with inflation right now, it'll sort of get muddled in there with that, along with COVID, mm. supply chain issues. It'll mm. get muddled in with – it's going to be very hard to separate out what's causing what. Good point. And I think – you know, not wanting to preempt recommendations, I think it's going to be really important for brands that know they're going to be affected, that they communicate that early and often and in a sensitive way and not sort of when things go wrong saying, well, it's not our fault, blame mm -hmm. this, but to actually point out to consumers early that there's going to be a knock-on effect. We are all watching intently. We know that this is real. And I think the brands that get this right from a communication point of view will get a lot more forgiveness than those that just use it as a as a blame when something goes wrong. Right. So communication, being transparent early and often. What else should marketers watch out for slash do slash avoid, particularly as it comes to uh, as it relates to to brand safety issues? Yes, yeah, so I think there's a major. I would imagine most brands have gone through a major risk exposure analysis to look at everything from. What happens if Putin decides to reprivatize all of the oil and gas in the country to what happens if there's a, a nuclear situation and how does that affect our business and our operations and our suppliers and their operations? So starting from that and keeping track of that, one of the things every business should be doing, not even the marketing side, but just preparing for increased cybersecurity mm -hmm. efforts and, and strengthening that. And then, the, you know, the other thing brands can do is just, you know, stop enabling or funding disinformation. And then the one thing we always recommend as it relates to brand standing is sort of understanding, starting from the point of view of your brand. So why, you know, you look at what we talked about in terms of H&M and Uniqlo, there could be a really good reason why one chooses to do one thing and one chooses to do another. But making that really, really clear and communicating that the not just what we're doing, but why we're doing it is increasingly important. Mm -hmm. Listening to consumers, what they say they want. And again, how does that align with your corporate goals and values? Engaging with the right sort of third parties, influencers, representatives, whatever that might be, both to listen and share what you're doing and get feedback on what you're doing. Making sure that you are ready, willing, and able to change because this is a fast evolving situation. And yet sort of at the same time, the, the corollary to that is recognize that building trust requires an investment and commitment over time, which is what brings us back to that sort of corporate value and alignment side of things. That mm -hmm. you, if you're consistent all the way through, there's plenty of research to show that consumers are more forgiving when things go wrong. They are more likely to defend a brand that aligns with their values. So there's, there's a lot that the brand should do first, then figure out how to communicate it. Unfortunately, it feels like often there's a communicate first, backtrack when we get some backlash. Mm -hmm. If we know what we're doing and why we're doing it, communicate that, you avoid those empty statements and focus more on the action or just go and do the action right. and wait to be asked about it, right? You don't right. have to applaud everything you do for yourself. Right. Final question, just on the, the advertising side of this. Uh, insider intelligence analyst Nina Getson was noting that Applebee's paused advertising on CNN after the network aired a split screen ad during coverage of airstrikes in Ukraine per ad age, an ad for Sandals Resorts also aired in the same format, which shows the news item on the left side of the screen and the ad on the right. Nina notes an unfortunate juxtaposition, given the headline on the left was Russia invades Ukraine. I'm sure it's going to be different for, for different folks, but in terms of approaching advertising and advertising around this issue, how should marketers uh, approach this, Dave? So I think brand safety has been something that advertisers have been worried about for a long time. Go back several years ago, Wall Street Journal front page, one of their reporters was beheaded in, in the Middle East. And that really led to this huge investment and push toward brand safety. So it's telling that there's only a couple of examples to some extent. Yes, it's unfortunate for Applebee's, but there's only a couple of examples where this went wrong. The speed mm -hmm. at which brands are able to pull down their ads 
it has improved considerably. And unfortunately, because of programmatic advertising, there's about 18 topics that, that brands typically avoid. But you know, when war breaks out, depending on how it's classified, depending on all these things are happening in such near real time, that things are going to appear, the best thing a brand can do is react and then work with the, the publisher, whomever that might be, to get that taken down. And I think Applebee's actually got a lot of press for their dissatisfaction. So they mm. got a lot of positive news from it in the end. Yeah, good point. Well, that's it for today's show. Uh, Dave, before we let you go, maybe a couple of takeaways from today's episode. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll sort of one takeaway and one addition, if you like. I think the idea of act before you speak has never been more true than it is here. You're seeing bars pouring Stolichnea down the, the sink, you know, not realizing that it's a Latvian brand, not a Russian brand. We're in Freedom Fries territory here, whereas other brands are taking really, really careful, thoughtful, considerate approach and then communicating that as appropriate. And um, the addition then, I would say, is if there is anyone who is wondering what they can do, one of our colleagues, Maria Elm, based in London, but is from Ukraine and shared with us uh, the website supportukrainenow.org. So that's, as it sounds, all one word, supportukrainenow.org, which has, as it says, real ways you can help Ukraine as a foreigner, everything from donation to posting on social media to hosting Ukrainians, hiring Ukrainians, volunteering in other ways. So lots of opportunities. If that is something that people want to do, those are links that have been vetted by Ukrainians and therefore you should feel safe at supporting any of those opportunities. Mm-hmm. Uh, that link that Dave was talking about, supportukrainenow.org, we'll put that link down below in the in the show notes in the description if you guys want to click on that. Well, that is all we have time for for today's episode. Dave, thank you so much for hanging out. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you to Victoria. She edits the show and thanks to everyone listening. We'll see you guys tomorrow, hopefully for the Behind the Numbers weekly listen and e-marketer podcast made possible by Mountain. Mountain.